Ephesians 2, we're going to start at verse number 11. He says, remember, wherefore remember that ye being in the times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the, excuse me, the flesh made by hands. In other words, when he uses terms like uncircumcision versus circumcision, he's talking about Jew versus Gentile, okay? So he says, you were, you're Gentiles in the past who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision or the Jews in the flesh made by hands. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Wait a minute, let's, let's pay attention to that for a second. Let's pay close attention to that passage. He says, as Gentiles, we were aliens from the real people of God. We were not considered the true people of God. Look what he says. He said, not only that, you were strangers from the covenants of promise. In other words, the word that God gave to his true people, we didn't even have access to it. We were, we were estranged from the truth of God's word. We, we weren't even a part of it. Look what he says. Having no hope, and really we didn't even have a God. He said, you didn't have a God in this world. That, that's, 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 ooh, Lord have mercy. Now, we know God's heart toward all of his creation, but from the perspective of context, he's letting us know that, that at, a, at one time we were without Christ. We were aliens from the true people of God, strangers from the covenant God had given them. We actually had no hope. And he says, and without God, didn't even have a God in this world. That's Gentiles. That's us. We didn't have access to the true God. We didn't have access to his covenants. He says you had no hope. Jesus, you, you didn't have a God in this world. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Woo! Hallelujah. We ought to give God a thing, a hand clap on that one. Just a little short hand clap, real quick one. <laughs> Because of what Christ did, now we can come close. We can be drawn close to God because of Jesus' blood. Now we have a God. We have access to the true God, not just a figment of God, but the true God. We have access to him because of what Christ did. So we're going to take it a little bit further. Verse 14. For he is our peace who hath made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. What he's saying, Jesus came to bring peace on the earth. He was our peace in particular. We didn't have peace with God because of Christ. He says, and made both one. Who is both? Jew ties and the Jews. The Gentiles and the Jews are now one in Christ. Because of Christ, we all have to do the same thing. The Gentiles don't have a separate word and we have another word. We all have the same word. We all have the same requirements, the same stipulations, if you will, to please God. He says, and have broken down the middle wall of partition. Remember, there was a, a wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. There was something between the Jews and all of us Gentiles. That we, we didn't have the same access. There was a, a, a division between us. As a matter of fact, Jesus even called a Gentile woman a dog. See, you... I don't, he says, not, it ain't right for me to give the children, the Jews, food to, bread to dogs. But the woman said, yeah, but the dogs eat the crumbs. <laughs> She's like, I'm going to get me something from the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, so what you got to understand, even though the Gentiles did not have access to God, God could not resist someone's faith. If they had faith in him, he couldn't resist them. Because this Gentile, he, he, was, he was trying not to help this Gentile woman. The plan was not to help her, but it's like he, she started moving his faith, moving in him by faith. She said, yeah, Lord, hey, I get all that. 
but, but the, these, the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. And she said, oh, he said, oh, woman. Oh, woman. Oh, God, you got me. Yeah, because faith always moved him. Anyway, but from a legal perspective, there was no connection with the Gentiles and the Jews. Verse 15. <clears throat> Having abolished in the flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. In other words, uh, the, the, the law had division within it because of the Jew, he said, and the Gentile. He says, but to make himself two into one new man. That means those that will trust in Christ. So making peace between the Jew and the Gentile. There is no more disconnection. So what that means is that right now, the Jews are still God's chosen people, but they do not accept Christ during this dispensation. They will be lost. A Jew that does not accept Christ will die lost because now you have to be in Christ to be acceptable to God. You have to be in Christ. Uh, some do say, well, we still, yeah, you're God's people, but if you don't accept Christ, you're going to die lost, especially during this dispensation. All right, verse 16. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. We won now in Christ because of the cross, all right? And came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them which were nigh. So he preached to the Jew and the Gentile. I preached to those that were far off, the Gentiles, and the ones that were close, which were the Jews. I preached to both of them and came and preached to you both. Preached peace to both of you, all right? 18. Keep going. For through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now we both, the Jew and the Gentile, both has access to God through the means of the spirit or by the means of the spirit. So here it is, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now, you have the same inheritance that the Jews had. When he, when he says saints, he's talking about the Jews. And you are now of the household of God because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Because once you accept Christ, you enter into God's household, and you're not a stranger, you're not a foreigner anymore. As a matter of fact, if you read about God's people coming out of Egypt, they, um, there was a people called the mixed multitude. And you read about the mixed multitude that came out of Egypt with God's people. They were actually Gentiles. But God included how to treat them within it because God was always after faith. Even though the law was what he used to bring people into subjection to his will, it was always going to be about faith. But notice, when God gave the law, um, when God made, I'm sorry, when God made his promise to Abraham, it was 400 years before the law was even given. So it wasn't being right with God was never really about the law. It was always about trust. It was always about faith in Christ, um, about faith in God, always, uh, because he gave the promise to Abraham before he gave the law. And so now, as we came into the, the, the kingdom of God, it was by faith. Because he said it's no longer about the law. Verse 20. Here it is. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That your entrance into the your entrance into the household of God is built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone of the building. Okay, he, He's the, the foundation from which the building is built. The, the household of God is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ or the cornerstone. All right, 21. He says, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth up 
unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple unto the Lord. I'm going to read it one more time, see if you get it. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple unto the Lord. We're being built on the foundation or the cornerstone of Jesus Christ and the prophets and apostles. That's the foundation. But now the building has been built and is fitly framed together. <laughs> fitly framed together to go into a holy temple unto the Lord. Why is that important? Somebody tell me why that's important. A holy temple unto the Lord. What's happening? What's going on here? Go ahead, Diane. Dion. Just say something. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's fine. That's good, good. Anybody else? Yes, Aaron. Okay. Without the foundation, you don't have anything. Yes. And then we are the building in which the Lord will live okay. and dwell. Okay. Okay. Good. Anybody else? That's good. Yeah, it is very good. <clears throat> so we'll go from there. That, huh? Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, you sure? Okay. So, so ultimately, he's talking about a place to dwell. God wants a place to dwell. He's looking for a place to dwell. Okay? He's looking for a holy temple to dwell in. Okay? He wants a place to dwell. He says, but look at how he's building the temple to dwell in. Let's go to verse 22. And then we'll, 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 we'll take a little bit further. In whom ye are also built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Does that make it clearer? Okay, what does it mean, Sharon? Okay, good. Okay, good. Good. That's great. Exactly. <clears throat> that, that God is looking for a place to dwell. And he's saying he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands anymore. He doesn't dwell in a building, so to speak. He doesn't, he doesn't dwell in a building. Oh, the Spirit of God is here. Well, guess why God's Spirit is here? Because we're here. Sharon said it right. We are the building material. We are the materials by which the temple is built. Okay? And you gotta, you got to understand that. We are the, he says here, in whom you are building, you're the building blocks for the habit, for place for God to dwell. He wants to dwell in you. And when y'all come together, you come together as a holy temple. Glory to God. That's why when two or three are gathered, he comes in the midst because I'm looking to dwell. But I don't want to be in the building if you ain't there. What 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 does that what does that what you know what what does that serve? What purpose does that serve? My presence is being there and not affecting nobody. The the the, the walls can't dance. He could probably make them dance, but you know, that's not what he want. <clears throat> he said he'll make a rock cry out, but that's not what he wanted to do. You know, the ultimate the ultimate goal is to dwell with us. And in us. Let, let's move on just a little bit. Um, let's look at something with Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40. This, and this is just dealing with. Okay, so during, during, before Christ came, 
Somebody tell me the holiest place in the world. Before Christ came, what was the most holy thing in the entire universe? Okay, which was in the temple, which is the tabernacle, temple. Holiest place on earth before Christ came was the temple. There was no place holier than that. The Holy of Holies was, was within, first the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant? Yes. Where, where it dwelt. The Ark of the Covenant was in the, ho was the holy place, then the most holy place, and the Ark of the Covenant dwelt in the most holy place. Yeah. That's where you couldn't walk him in there anyway, any kind of way. All right. So let's look at this real quick. Um, he says, and thou shalt take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle, and all that is therein shalt, uh, shalt hallow it, and all the vessels thereof, and it shall be holy. This, this was dealing with the tabernacle. Uh, the tabernacle was before the temple, as you guys know. And so notice his dwelling place. What's that? To make it holy. Hallow means to make it holy. Yeah, make your name holy. Yeah, keep your name holy. Yes, absolutely. To hallow, excuse me, to hallow is to make holy. No, he says, and thou shalt hallow it. Thou shalt make it holy. Okay? Obviously, that's physical and mental. I mean, as, as we, as we uh, consider a place. Think about when you go into a place. Anybody ever go to somebody's house and don't like they want you to take the shoes off on their carpet? I mean, you know, I have my personal feelings about that. But anyway, the point is, they want you to hallow their ground, hallow their carpet, basically. You know, I'm, anyway, to hallow their carpet or whatever they want. Same, same principle. You want to make the place holy. You want to, you, he was saying he wants the tabernacle. And the way he looked at it, the anointing oil represented his presence. He said, anoint the tabernacle. Get the anointing oil and, and everything in the tabernacle. Anoint everything in it. Make all the vessels, because once you, once you anoint it, it now becomes holy. Everything you touch, everything you anoint, because the presence of God has touched it, now it is holy. Okay? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 16. <clears throat> he says, Know you not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, the presence of God now doesn't dwell in the tabernacle. It doesn't dwell in the, holy, in the holiest of holies in the holy temple. He says that the Old Testament, the, the temple, the tabernacle, the showbread, the seven candlestands, the candlesticks, the candlestands, the showbread, the, the uh, basin, all of that stuff were nothing but shadows. They were... They were um, yeah, basically shadows and, and figures of what was to come. Shadows and figures. They, had, they were representations of what he wanted. So, so many would say uh, that the, the holiest of holies was a representation of the holy of holies in heaven. That the way that, remember God gave the exact directions on how he wanted a tabernacle built exact to the, to, the, to the millimeter or centimeter of what he wanted and how he wanted things represented. And so ultimately, ultimately, it was a representation. So what many say is that when Jesus, because Jesus was God the Father, God the Son, Jesus was, he was God in the Son's perspective. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, all are God but have different functions. God the Father is the creator. God the Son was the one that was our Savior to come down for our sins. God the Holy Spirit is God's active agent on earth, but they're all God. Jesus came, offered his sacrifice, and when he offered it on earth, some say he went to heaven and received it as God, <laughs> received his own sacrifice. Glory to God. And it came back to earth to set us free. Ultimately, the goal is that now God doesn't dwell in a building. He doesn't dwell in buildings. He dwells in human beings. This is where he dwells. Glory to God. And so when, when you begin to understand this is where he dwells, 
Because guess what? God is looking for a place to dwell. You got to understand. Notice over these last, maybe last month or so, we've been feeling God's presence at a different level. You know why? He wants to dwell. Can, can I dwell here? I'm going to come and give you all a taste of what I can do when I'm in there. Now, can, can, you, can you handle it? Can, can you handle it? Because I want to come and live. I want to come and set up camp right here. And I was thinking about it. I said, now, anybody have had anybody live with them? Anybody have come and live with you, at your house with you? You ever taken in people to live with you? Fam, family or friend? Okay. So imagine, imagine somebody calls and Bill Gates says, hey, can I come stay with you for about a year? Okay, yeah. Because you know, if he comes to stay with you, he's going to pay some bills. You know, he's he going to take care of some stuff. You know, yeah, come on. I just, I just want to live with you, you know, because I know, you know, you, you probably say, yeah, because, you know, he got resources. He's, he, for whatever reason, he wants to live with you, pray, come on. He's going to have some money in your account. You ain't got to pay no, you're going to have food. You're going to have everything because Bill Gates living with me. Glory to God, come on in, man. Matter of fact, you can have my room. You can have my room, no problem, because it's going to be worth it. So, so, so think about it from that perspective. God said, I made Bill Gates rich, <laughs> glory to God. Now I want to come live with you. Can you handle it? Can you handle my presence in your house? Can you handle my presence in your house? Let's, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6. Because this is what he's asking us. He's asking us as a church, as a balm of Gilead, can I come and live with you? I want to come and, and, and so, so Jesus, think about all the things you would have access to if Bill Gates lived with you. You'd have free Google, you'd have free Microsoft. <clears throat> uh, so many things you didn't even think about. So imagine if God moves in. Hallelujah. What things will be available to you? And my thing, you know what I think about the most? Is the peace that will come with his presence. Just some peace. Sometimes you don't need no money. You just need peace. Money can't buy what you need. I need some peace. Glory. Here it is. First six, chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have from God and ye are not your own wait a minute don't you know that God is looking to dwell with us by dwelling in you as an individual that's what he's looking at so he says don't you know haven't you realized that your body because 1 Corinthians 3 tells us that you're the temple of God and that God's spirit dwells in you. He said, ha haven't you figured it out yet that your body is the temple? God don't dwell in the temples of man no more. He deals in you as the temple. He says, and you, and he says, the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost lives within you. He says, and God is the one that gave it to you. And since God gave you his spirit, you no longer belong to yourself. You can't dictate your life anymore. Whoa. Because we, nobody got the Holy Ghost that didn't want it. Check, catch that. <clears throat> nobody received the Holy Ghost because you didn't want it. Everybody received the Holy Ghost got it because you wanted it. You sought after it. You wanted, you heard about the power of the Holy Ghost. You heard the strength and the, the overcoming ability that comes with the Holy Spirit. Some of you were strung out on stuff and got hooked on stuff, and the Holy Spirit sets you free. Even the thinking, the feelings. You know, the Holy Spirit did some work. Glory to God. <clears throat> and he said, so you asked for it, so you got to realize you can't get nothing for free in this world. <laughs> you asked for it, you got to give up something. <laughs> something you got to give up. And what you had to give up is your right to your body. Do y'all hear me? You had to give up your right to your body to get the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. You don't have the right to watch porn. You don't have the right to get drunk. You don't have the right to do what you want with your body. You don't have, you don't have the right to, to put things in your body or do things with your body that is not congruent with the will of the Holy Ghost. You are not your own. Okay? You are not your own. You can't do what you want with it. 
in particularly, let me, let me, let me, I see it got quiet. I know scary, scared a few people, but <clears throat> understand that, that ultimately he's talking about patterns of living. Patterns. You can't con day by day be addicted to stuff. You can't be. Not if you got the Holy Ghost. I mean, if you're addicted to stuff, the Holy Spirit's not active in your life. And you can look at it any way you want, slice it any way you want. It's not accurate. It's not operating. Because you can't stay addicted to anything and the Holy Spirit be alive in your life. Right? And so, or, or controlled, let alone addicted. How about just controlled by something? Your flesh can't control you. And, and the Holy Spirit is in the same place. It's not active because something's not connecting right. So he says, don't you realize your body is a place where the Holy Ghost lives? Which you have from God, and you got to realize you are not your own. Catch that. Because when God moves in, he's going to take over. When God comes to dwell, he's coming to take over. And he's not coming to ask you permission to use your body. I'm going to do what I want with you. And you better yield to me so that the will of God can be completed. Verse, 9, verse 20. For you are bought with a price. <clears throat> You've been bought. Okay. <laughs> no, I won't go there. The, the point is, you've been bought with a price. What was the price? The blood of Christ. <clears throat> Christ's blood was shed for you. Glory to God. So that you could be redeemed for eternity. And in, the, in exchange for you being saved from death, and eternal damnation. He said, the least you can do is give me your body. Woo, Jesus. That's the least you can do is give me your body to use and stop trying to make your own decisions. Don't you know God never intended us to make our own decisions? Y'all didn't know that, did you? I'm going to prove it to you. Man shall not live by, but by, wait a minute, some words. No, no, a few of the words. Every word that proceeds out of whose mouth? Out of the mouth of God. Why are you deciding how to serve God and when you're going to serve God? You don't have that right. You're bought with a price. Oh, help us, glory. <clears throat> Therefore, glorify God in your body and what? Your spirit, <clears throat> which also belongs to God. Your spirit is the unseen part of you. You can't see my spirit. You can see my body, but you can't see my spirit. <clears throat> and so I could be saying, Sharon, I love you, and my spirit could be hating you, right? And you don't even see that. But guess what? God sees it. You see, you got jealousy. You got envy. You got inordinate affection. I was in prayer the other day. The Lord said, there's some dirt in your spirit. And I was like, he said, I want to come dwell with you. But you got some dirty stuff still in your spirit. And I was like, he said, nobody can see it, but I see it. And he started to show me where there was some dirt left, some of the things I think. He said, you got to get that kind of thinking out of your head. I was like, oh, Jesus. I said, okay, I got it. I was telling my wife today just how some things are starting to, I'm feeling some things released from me. They've been, they, and they were so stuck in me, I didn't realize they were there. I didn't even realize that some, some, we had a conversation last night about some things, and after we had a conversation, I just started feeling a release. Like stuff is popping off, popping out. <clears throat> and it had to do with my spirit that she couldn't see, you can't see, nobody could see. And so those things that we think, God... When he comes to dwell with you, he's going to watch how you think. What kind of thoughts are you having about your spouse? What kind of thoughts are you having about your friend? What kind of thoughts are you having about your desires? What kind of thoughts are you having about how you live? He says, so because if I come to dwell close to you, I'm going to be close to everything about you. Matter of fact, I'm going to be in you. And since I'm in you, 
I feel what you feel, I see what you see, and I think what you think. In other words, from the standpoint of, of paying attention to you, he's connected to your thoughts. He said he knows your thoughts before you think them. <clears throat> and so he says, so if you, since you're bought with a price, and if you want me to dwell close to you, you better recognize that you got to learn to glorify God in your body and your spirit because both of them now belong to God. They both belong to him. God's looking for a place to dwell. Can he dwell with you? That's the question. Can he dwell with us? Can he dwell with you? Can he dwell with me? Glory to God. He, he wants to. He wants to dwell. So look at, let's look at Leviticus 11. <clears throat> Leviticus 11. He says... For I am the Lord your God. You shall there sanctify what? And what? And shall be holy. Why? For I am holy. Neither shall you devour yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. That includes men and women creeping in and out of your house. <laughs> <coughs> Hallelujah. They creep. We call it creeping in college. <clears throat> they creeping. Four in the morning, you look out the window, see somebody sneaking, you know. Where you going? I'm creeping. He says, he says, don't defile yourself. You know, you know what's interesting. So, so, so the, the, the Sadducees and the, the, the religious leaders of the day came to Jesus because Jesus' disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. They didn't wash their hands. And they came to tell Jesus, your disciples are nasty. They don't even wash their hands before they eat. Jesus said, let me tell you something. It's not what goes in a man that defiles him, what comes out of him that defiles him. He's defiled by what comes out, not by what goes in. So the defilement is the spirit. Your spirit defiles you. If you have anger, unchecked, if you have jealousy, if you have envy, if you have backbiting, if you have judgmental spirits, don't you know that's spirit? That, those are spirit sins, sins of the spirit. That's why he told him, he says, you know, don't, don't be involved with jealousy, envy, backbiting. Oh, he tells you all those things that, are, that defile your spirit. And so he says, so sanctify yourselves <clears throat> and you shall be holy. When he says sanctify yourself, what does that mean? Somebody tell me what does it mean to sanctify? Sharon. To be set apart. To be set apart. And what else? Separated. Separated and holy. Holy. So the word sanctification, if you look at sanctification, the, the term sanctification is the process of becoming holy. It is the process. So he says Become, get into the process. <laughs> How do they call it? Trust the process. <laughs> Glory to God. <clears throat> Make yourself holy. If you sanctify yourself, if you become part of the process, then you shall be holy. <clears throat> For I am holy and don't defile yourselves. Glory to God. And so, Jesus, when you think about defiling, I've often thought about um, things that we see, things that we allow ourselves to be connected to. Um, I was sitting, this is many years ago, I was sitting with a pastor at, we were at Applebee's, right? And we were at Applebee's and uh, this song came on, I, I think it was, um, um, oh, what's the name of that song? Um, Pinball Wizard, anybody remember that song? Probably not. Uh, pin, from from the from the um, the movie Tommy, remember that movie Tommy, Pinball Wizard, got to be a trip. Whatever. We the song came on. He said, "Man, can we leave? You mind if we go to another place to eat?" I'm like, "Why? Well, what's up?" He said, "I don't like that music." He felt like the music was defiling him. That, that was his. You know, different people are different. But some people get to a point where they don't want to hear certain things. You can become that sensitive where certain things will bother you. 
I was just today, and the reason I thought about it because it just started, that was years ago, and I, I didn't quite understand it. I can understand it more now. You know, some of you just don't want to hear certain things. You know, you just don't. I, I, I hate hearing loose ends. Remember the group loose ends? Some of y'all don't remember loose ends. Okay. That's, that's before y'all time, y'all old youngsters. But that was, that, they, they were the hit song out in the 80s, mid-80s. All the time I was out doing my crazy stuff, wrong stuff, that was the song that was hitting. So those songs remind me of when I was out doing the wrong things. I really don't want to hear it. It reminds me of stuff I was doing wrong during that time. And I, I don't like hearing loose ends. And that song, that movie, the music was hitting. It was hitting, but I just, to this day, I can't stand their music. <clears throat> and so you have to be careful <clears throat> the process of sanctification so God can have a place to dwell. Because maybe if you don't hear it, God don't want to hear it either. There's some things God don't want to hear. Um, I get these reels on my phone in the morning, and some people have their, have their picture on the, on the little Facebook thing, and, and they got music playing. And when I start hearing them F words, it's like, oh, God. It's next, next. <clears throat> you know, it's like, I, I, I get vexed by hearing that, that cussing and stuff, personally. And so the thing is that, so for me to listen to it is for me to defile myself, for me. And we all have a certain areas we grow to. Sanctification is the process of becoming holy. In sanctification, in the process of sanctification, every year something ought to drop off your life. Something ought to drop off. You shouldn't be able to experience the same worldly stuff every year and feel comfortable with it. You shouldn't. Not, not somebody's in the sanctification process. If you just kind of just going to church just to go, surely. You know, I was listening to a guy today. He was talking about somebody can stay in church 30 years and all they ever do is learn how to give and be faithful. They never grow. They, they know how to give every Sunday. That's all they know how to do. They haven't grown or developed at all. And so that, that, that process is, is something, thank you, is, is something that's, um, <clears throat> you know, that, that we should be, be concerned about because we have to be concerned about God coming to dwell with us. God wants a place to dwell. He's looking for a place to dwell. And we have to consider all these things as, we, as he looks for a place to dwell. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. And, and so I'm, I'm going to go to something really quick here. Let's go to two other things. I'm just going to stop for tonight. i got a lot to go over. We're going to pick this up. But let's look at Mark chapter 11 and verse 17, then Isaiah 56. It's going to be quick, too. Because God is looking for a house to dwell in. He's looking for a place to dwell. And where does he want to dwell? In us, in us as individuals. So, so we want God wants us to be his house. He taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called, shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But you have made it a den of thieves. My house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. The application to this, or the typology is, is your house a house of prayer? Is your temple a house of prayer? Glory. Is it? You don't have to answer out loud. So if God comes to this house, is he going to have prayer going on on a constant basis? In this house, which is you. Thank you, Jesus. Is it a house of prayer? Isaiah 56, 7. <clears throat> Glory to God. Same, pretty much the same thing. He says, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Can people depend on you to pray? Is your house, is your temple a place where prayer is consistently going on? My house shall be called a house of prayer. To be that place for God to dwell, prayer has to be consistently going on. It has to be constant. It has to be consistent. Glory to God for God to be pleased. Glory to God. Ah, Jesus. I'm, I'm going to skip one and go. I'm going to go to something else. Exodus 30. <clears throat> Exodus 30, verse 7. Because God's looking for a place to dwell. And he wants to dwell with you. Will, will your body be the place where you can dwell? Exodus chapter 30, verse 7 and 8. Will, your, will, your, will you be the place God can dwell? Or will he have to look over you? Because if he comes in too close, he'll be a problem. Remember now, 
when God comes in, he's expecting things to be in place. Think people get too close to God. When God comes in too close, people start dying. Things start happening. All right, here we go. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps. He shall burn incense upon it. Verse 8. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Now notice, some of y'all have seen, I don't have time to go through it tonight, but in Revelation, it talked about how when we pray that the angels offer incense with our prayers. When we pray, the angels are involved in our prayers. In, in uh, Revelation 5 and Revelation 8, and we'll go over it maybe next time. But when we pray, the angels are offering incense unto God with our prayers. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> and so, because they want to hear, they want our prayers to be answered because angels are involved in answered prayers. Angels get involved in answering our prayers. They move. And uh, matter of fact, all of us have angels attached to our lives. They're ministering spirits to minister for those that shall be heirs of salvation. Hebrews 2. Angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those that will be heirs of salvation. Those of us who will be saved, angels are a major part of our life. They work in our behalf. The problem is they don't move without prayer. They don't move unless prayer is being offered. So I always say, is your angel bored? Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Glory to God. Is your angel bored or is your angel able to do? So he says, he was talking about how God... Look for that incense to come up, to look for the incense. Thank you, Jesus, with the prayer. Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and, the, and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. No, I'm sorry. I said, no, Ephesians. I'm sorry, Ephesians. Ephesians 5. I'm reading the wrong thing. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. So Aaron Talk about Aaron burning the, the incense. The incense, don't you know that it's interesting how the incense um, was burned every day, he says, as a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout all generations. To be a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout all generations. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. That he, he look, God looks for the incense to burn. Remember, the things from the Old Testament were shadows and images of what was going to really come. So here we go. He says, Therefore, be ye followers of God as dear children. You can also use that word followers. You can also use the word imitators. Okay? Be their imitators of God as dear children or followers of God as dear children. Verse 2. He says, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So ultimately, thank you, Jesus. Matter of fact, let's go on to one more. Y'all got that? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. So you got that. Imitators of God, because of Christ's offering, sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So when Christ was sacrificed on an offer, a sweet smell went to God. A sweet savor went to God because of Christ's sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 2. <clears throat> verse 14 through 16. And so ultimately, you see what God looks for. He looks for us to be, as, oh, he looks for a sweet smell of sacrifice to come from the earth as worship unto him. So here we go. Let's catch this one. Now, thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Make manifest the savor. Uh-huh of his knowledge by us in every place. All right? Verse 15, we're going to take it on. For we are unto God a what? Sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Whoa! We give God what he's looking for. Aaron and the, Aaron and the, the, the priest would offer the sacrifice to God because God offered 
for that savor. But that was only a type and shadow of what God ultimately wanted to have the sweet smelling incense under him, which was us. We were always what he was looking for as the sweet smelling savor. Verse 16. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. Who is sufficient for these things? Number, are you sufficient to offer that to God? Whoa, glory to God. Are you able to give God the savor, the instant, the smell that he wants from you? Don't you know you carry a smell? <laughs> Whoa. Jesus, you carry a savor, a smell. He says, and who is sufficient to carry that? Is your savor death? Is your incense, your sweetness, death, or is it life? Woo, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> God wants to dwell with you, but what kind of savor are you offering? Your actions give off a smell. They give off a scent. Your, your actions, your desires, your thoughts, your feelings, your spirit gives God something to smell. Is it sweet or is it nasty? Is it death or is it life? He's looking for a place to dwell. He don't want to dwell in no stinky place. God wants to dwell in a place of sweetness. And what will you offer to him? Lastly, ah, real quick, uh, Psalm 138, and then we're going to go to Revelation and we'll end it. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. I want you to think about this as you go home. Can, I, can God dwell with me? Can he come and dwell in my house? Can he dwell in this house? Can he dwell with me daily? Psalm 138, verse 2, and then we're going to Revelation 11, 1. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy love and kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified your word above all thy name. I will worship God toward the holy temple and praise thy name for his love and kindness. And that word love and kindness, some of y'all remember this from prayer center, is the word hesed. H-E-S-E-D, the Hebrew word is hesed. The, that word hesed, there are books written on that one word. There are entire books written on that one word hesed. Because the word hesed, we have no one English word to define that word. The word is so vast, there's no one word to define it. Hesed is, is defined as mercy, loving kindness, peace, joy, the word is so powerful, it's, it's plugged in in different places, in different contexts, but it all goes back to the same word. The best way to define hesed is probably loving kindness and mercy. Probably the best, but it has probably six, seven different meanings in English. <clears throat> but he's saying, I praise God for all the goodness that he is to us. I praise God because of his mercy. And I think about just mercy. If you praise God for mercy, my God, you'd be praising all night long. <clears throat> because he's shown mercy on all of us. I mean, we didn't deserve some of the things God has done, but we praise him for his mercy. He said, but how about his loving kindness? See, instead of judging you, he showed you kindness. He said, the goodness of the Lord ought to lead you to repentance. God's been so good. You ought to say, God, I'm so sorry. You, I deserve to be judged, and you, ble you bless me anyway. That's loving kindness. <clears throat> he, said, so, so, and he said, and you've magnified your word above your name. Glory to God, the magnifying of God which comes out of a loving temple. I'm, I'm worshiping him out of the holy temple. The worship is coming out of a holy temple, which is me. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm worshiping out of the holy temple. Lastly, Revelation 11, 1. <laughs> oh, Jesus, here we go. Attention to this one. <clears throat> because worship is a part of it as well. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise, measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Read it again. Should I put this in NIV if you don't mind? <clears throat> yeah. Because this is, this is a, um, a deep one. And I was given a reed like a measuring rod and told, 
Go measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. So he said, I, I need to see if things are measuring up. Go measure the temple. Let's make sure we know the temple is, in, is, is the, right, uh, the right measurements, the right degree. Measure the altar and then measure the worshipers. <laughs> see if they meet up to my qualifications. See if the worshipers, make sure the worshipers measure up to what I'm looking for. Measure them. Measure the temple. It's going to be all right. Measure the altar. I gave you the dimensions for it. Now, are the worshipers meeting their degree? Are the worshipers meeting what I required of them? Measure them. Just don't look. Measure them to make sure they're measuring up to what I'm requiring. There's a worship God looks for every time you come to his house. There's a worship and a praise God expects from you because he knows what he's done for you. Somebody said, well, I, I just worship quiet. Really? The word praise comes from the word halal, which means to be clamorously foolish, to be stultified. That means the word stultified simply means to be examined and found crazy. That's what that word means. And, and so God looks for a certain level of praise. Can he dwell with you, though? Because can you give him the praise he wants? Or you say, well, I'm just a quiet-natured person. I just don't, you know, I'm sorry. I just do my praise inwardly. Well, God, <laughs> you know, God said, okay, well, you need an outward blessing, don't you? <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. So ultimately, God is looking for a place to dwell. Can he dwell with you? Can he dwell with us? Ultimately, the in, it's an individual thing. He, when he's looking for a place to dwell. He wants to come and be among us. But to come and be among us, they got to be among us individually. Glorify God in your body and your spirit, which belongs to God. Your body no longer belongs to you. It is God's body. Stop making your own decisions. Find out what God's word says about your decision making. What does his word tell you to do? What does his word tell you? How does the word tell you to worship him? Because if not, he's going to chastise you to get you where he wants you to be. Isn't it beautiful how God beats us to bless us? He, he, he chastises us so he can bless us. I can't bless you doing life your way. Then you think you did it. <laughs> you think you blessed. You think you got blessed because of what you do. It's always me. Glory to God. But I'm measuring you to see. Nah, he's about, about two weeks short. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> he's about a month behind. His worship, no, he can give a lot more than that. Measuring them lungs. That lungs you, don't, you didn't even use one-tenth of your lung capacity in that worship service. You got, you got another nine-tenths available to me. You better give all that to me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I need more from you. I need more from you. And then I need less of that flesh from you. Less of that flesh from you. Stand on your feet, everybody. Get, get, your, get yourself together so I can come dwell with you. <clears throat> Get your act together so I can come dwell with you. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we glorify your name. And we thank you because you want a place to dwell. You're looking for a place to come and dwell. You're looking for a people to dwell in. Oh, God, and you want to dwell. You've already said you want to dwell in us. But, God, help us to see ourselves as you see us. Help us to let this word identify who we really are. Let this word tonight bring us to an understanding of what we must do, where we must go, where we're falling short, where we don't measure up. Oh, God, and come to understand your way, your will, and your word. Oh, God, so that we don't have to understand your wrath. Oh, God, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the word. I feel energized because of what you're doing in our midst. And I pray you help us all be energized to do your will, to do your word, to do your work, so we don't have to deal with your wrath. God, I pray at another level for your presence to come in among us. Because when you come to live with us, everything is taken care of. All provision is made. All purpose is fulfilled. All power is gained. All provision is provided. All things come together because of your presence in our hearts and even in our midst. So, God, let us welcome you with a holy temple. Let us welcome you with a holy mind, a holy spirit, a holy soul. That, God, we can give you what you're looking for. That we will be measured and found not wanting. Measured and found perfectly in position and in place. I pray, God, help us to fight this flesh tooth and nail oh god so your presence can come dwell with us because we belong to you and you only not to ourselves but to you bless us as we leave this place that our minds and hearts will be focused on giving you a place to dwell in jesus name hallelujah let's give the lord a praise 
Oh, God, so he can come and dwell. 